OMG, baby, tell them. Hey there, welcome to Powered by Backers. It's Justin. Um, I'm here. Uh, another great day, another great guest. I have Sean McCormick. Sean, thank you very much for joining me on the show. Thanks, Justin. Nice hoodie, man. Yeah, yeah well, we just, we, I just went and put it on just for the show. Represent the Oil Nation. Um, you're from Edmonton. I'm just a, I guess a, I don't know, a wayward fan from the East Coast. That's all right. We're an easy team to like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I grew up in the East. You're an easy team to fall in love with. Well, that's difficult teams to like. So to, to, to yeah. continue the love, right? It's maybe a love hate relationship, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've stuck with yeah. them through the years. As I said, I grew up sort of in the uh, the early '80s, Gretzky, Messier, you know, in the heydays, and that was kind of I latched onto a, the bandwagon, and I've kind of maintained the fandom ever since. So. <laughs> Cool. So I'll do a quick bio um, intro. Yep. So you are with uh, VP of Sales for Moneris. Uh, a number of other things, but one of the things that I, I wanted to talk to, you were a sports broadcaster um, with Rogers Sportsnet um, sort of a, a few years back. Um, so we'd love to talk a little bit about that and maybe sort of the trajectory of where you went from there to where you are today. I know you, you gave me a slow clap, which I thought was unreal <laughs> about the 3HL. Um, yeah. so I mean, love the three HL. you love the three HL. So we can, we I wish can, I wasn't so old. I'd love to play in it. I'm to, too old now though. To, to jump in. Did you play junior at all? Or where did you play? Uh, I played, uh, I played some, uh, some tier two out in Manitoba. Uh, that was just the best hockey I ever played though. The most fun I had playing was uh, senior hockey in, uh, in Saskatchewan back. Okay. Uh, so my first gig in broadcasting, my, it was in Yorkton, uh, right at a school and there's, nothing to do in Yorkton. I don't know if you okay. know that or I, I've not. never heard of not Yorkton. Not a lot to do there. So that's uh, probably why I've, I've never heard of it. It was even worse than <laughs> having heard of it and not knowing that there's something to do there, right? Or, yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was, it was was a great league. It was the, um, what was it called? The Triangle Hockey League, I think it was called. It was this uh, geographic area, Southeast Saskatchewan. And uh, okay. it was good hockey, man. Because you got all these little towns, right? Like that are... Um, you know, 500 people, a thousand people. And, um, and they like, you'll have 400 of the 500 people in the town at the <laughs> rank on Friday night <laughs> right. to watch senior hockey. Like, Is it kind of like the WOAA or like the AAA senior AAA here? Kind of like very that. Similar. It's very similar. Very similar. So would they play for the, Oh, I'm going to, the, not the man cup. That's lacrosse. What's the, What's the, the Allen, Allen Cup? No. Allen Cup. Allen Cup. Is it the Allen? Yeah, Allen Cup. Yes. I think it was the Allen. Yeah. Allen Cup. Yeah. So would they uh, play for that at some point? Yeah. If yeah. So I think the Allen was like get BC, way out of my Ontario. Company. That's right. Different yeah. provinces. So yeah. uh, that was pretty fun. I, I wasn't good at A lot of guys got paid. Uh, I got free sticks. Okay. So that tells you like where I was. <laughs> the the, the level of play. Yeah. They're like, cool. okay, you, you get a Jersey, you get to sit on the hey, bench. Exactly. That was, that was I your payment. Watch me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Well, Hey, that's, that's better hockey than I ever played. So I I'm the opposite. I never really play. I mean, I played sort of a double a in what was called the MTHL now, arguably the GTHL in Toronto. Um, yeah. you know, and then I think one year of triple a and then kind of, that's pretty much was the end of my career. But I, I decided when I saw the three on three, you know, still a hockey fan, I saw the exciting end to end action. I thought, yeah. what if there was a three on three pro hockey league and yeah. at a bar with a buddy and just literally was like, what would we call it? Yeah. I Googled yeah. or actually got the domain .ca, didn't get .com, kind of had some issues with that, but literally incorporated the business the next morning, November yeah. 11th, 2015 so uh 3hl inc and literally created a twitter page and within a couple months had um you know over a thousand followers just from saying hey we're gonna start a three-on-three pro hockey league didn't even really know how we were gonna do it but um yeah so that was my i went from not being able to play to trying to create my own pro hockey league so yeah yeah, no, that was, uh, well, I wish you the best of luck on that going it's, forward, man. That's a it, great idea. Yeah, it's Love it's it. it's on hold a little bit, and that's kind of how I got into backers. Um, what I'm doing now is I was trying to fund the teams, and I came across the idea of the uh, Green Bay Packers and basically the community-owned team, and sort of that's how I got into equity crowdfunding, saw that as an opportunity for the 3HL. No one was really – it was a new sort of rule, new regulation – 
no one was really facilitating it. So I literally said, okay, let's create my own platform, fund my own league. And yeah, yeah Bob's your uncle kind of thing. So yeah, right um, on. Anyways, anyways, enough about me. So what uh, you went into sports broadcasting. So what, I, I don't know if I don't want to hit a nerve, but what took you out of yeah, fair question. Yeah, no, it's a fair question. I'd um, so I've been I I've been to, but my last year at Sportsnet was I think twenty ten. Okay. Um, and I've been doing it for about fifteen years. I've been in the business and yeah, great, great, greatest job. And I've seen you. I've seen you right? on TV back in the day. So yeah, it's uh, so, so we had a viewer. That's amazing. Well, nice <laughs> to finally meet you. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do it for that. No, no, but seriously, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, I, I, I remember seeing you on TV. So, I mean, yeah. right. Yeah. It's, you had more than one viewer, I'm sure. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like anything, man. And I think a lot of your, you know, a, a lot of your subscribers will probably agree, um, you know, because they're cut from that, that maybe a, a you know, a similar cloth is that, you can do something for so only so long before um, you kind of get antsy and you got to try something new. Right. Um, it's not that what you're doing isn't, isn't fun and right. it's not um, something that's really cool and it might be the best job ever. In fact, there's a day goes by. I don't think about broadcasting how awesome it was, but day to day you need a challenge. And um, uh, my goal when I got into broadcasting was to, was to, to find a 10 o'clock chair national. Uh, in, okay. in sports at a national right. network. Um, so I, it took me about, uh, I think, nine years to do that. So I got here in, in, to tro in Toronto in 2002. So I had eight years in Toronto um, working at Sportsnet, worked my way up to that, to that 10 o'clock anchor spot. And then I was kind of like, well, after <laughs> what's a couple next? Years, I was like, what's next, right? And I knew I didn't want to go to the States because I, you know, I got married and had a family or I didn't have a family. I was just going to say, or you didn't do the Jay and Dan route, like go down and, and kind of. No, originally that was my, I was what I was thinking about doing. I, yeah. you know, that's, there's more money down there in broadcasting. Right. It's, you know, it's a bit more, um, you know, it's, it's Hollywood down there, but, um, but I decided that I, it, my priorities changed. And then I was like, well, what do I want to do? I don't want to be sitting on the desk when I'm, you know, 60, the desk, like the highlight yeah, you know, yeah. The show yeah. Yeah. when I'm 50 years old and have somebody push me out the door because a younger, you know, a younger looking, you, a younger more version hair of you. Rolled in, right? right. Right. Yeah. So it was a bit of self-preservation. So I, I made the tough call to uh, figure out a pivot. Uh, right. And that was in 2010. I was, um, I guess I, I'm 46 now. So we're at 36 at the time. And everybody wondered what I was doing. They thought I was completely nuts um, because 36 is kind of your kind of your prime for broadcasting, 35, 36. But I couldn't see any more upside. I wanted to get into management. Uh, nobody at, at Rogers believed that um, I had any any business acumen, and they were probably right because at the time at I the didn't have a lot. Right. Um, so what I tried to do. And that's why I founded the music festival, uh, a rock music festival called Queen West Music Fest. We had, nice. we ran for about five years. We had some, had some decent acts play, like had the Trues and Maestro Fresh okay. West and wow. uh, Sky Diggers and uh, Gordy Johnson from Big Sugar. Wow. Um, and uh, what, what my, my strategy was, I needed a pivot because I realized that I wasn't going to be able to convince Rogers to, to give me a job and right. any, any, with any sort of, business responsibility at any significant outside. level right you might have got like early entry level type of stuff but you'd be taking a huge kind of no step honestly back dude I, or nothing they no were giving i was nothing. happy to take an entry level position oh, yeah? i just i wanted a vine and I, they wouldn't they wouldn't, they wouldn't swing me oh, one. Really, so really? okay and the feedback i got in every in every one of these interviews internal interviews like i thought that'd be a you know pretty pretty good place to start <laughs> yeah. it was all like well you need you need a bigger resume and so i so I thought, well, why don't I go do this? I knew I could sell because I'd done, you know, I, I had a, a real small business when I was in university, pressure washing. And so okay. I knew, and that was all door to door. Right. And I, so I knew I could sell. So I thought, um, you know, okay, I, I gotta, I gotta, gotta figure something out that has sales in it. And I loved music and music to this day is, it's a passion. It's as big a passion as sports. sports. Okay. And, um, and I, uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, Virgin Music Festival on Toronto Island. 
Okay. Um, this is back in the back in the late, uh, you know, the you know maybe 06, 07, 05, 06, 07. At the at the Ontario place or at the amphitheater? It was actually on they? Toronto Island. On the island. Um, okay. They only had it for a couple of years. Okay. Um, and then the residents over there got you know got all antsy. The, with the, the noise, sick, but... Talk about the one resident, right? The one resident. Yeah, the that resident. Lives on the, yeah, the resident. Guy. Yeah, the four the four cottages that live that on the side of the island. And literally, the, yeah, yeah, and they and they won't allow airports to go in on the island. They don't want concerts. All for those five residents on the island, right? Yeah, they have a lot of pull. They have a yeah. lot of pull. Somebody big must so live. Yeah, for five residents. Yeah. But anyways, yeah. yeah. So, but it was a, it was an awesome event, and this was sort yeah. of at the start of the music festival craze. It was my first sort of um, dipping the toe in the water as a fan, yeah. as a as a as a as a music lover. And I thought, wouldn't this be awesome to do this in Trinity Bellwoods Park, which was near, which is downtown Toronto, yeah. where uh, almost right across the street from where I lived at the time. So this this was kind of all meeting at the same time. Um, and I thought, well, why don't I call the city and see if I can do a concert in the park and sell all my own advertising? I'll, I'll reach out to all of these these sponsors, like, you know, like TD and Coke right. and Blackberry. Blackberry was big at the time. Remember right. those guys? Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, Jim Ball silly. I wonder if he's still trying to, maybe he could buy a three HL team. He's probably, he, yeah, he can know, afford right? yeah, Depending on where his money's gone over <laughs> yeah. the years. I think he can afford a three HL team. Right. Uh, yeah. In Hamilton, so, uh, we'll bring him a three HL team in Hamilton. There you yeah, go. He'll get, yeah, he'll get his dream. Um, <laughs> right that was a pretty big dig on, on Jim Balsilli. and hopefully Jim you're watching no harm yeah. no foul anyways yeah. Yeah. um okay so yeah so, so, yeah, so the, Bellwoods, the park that had the very first COVID party just recently I don't know if you saw that that's on right there. I just drove by today and there's a bunch of homeless people camped out oh the, uh, but did, they used to use it for concerts now they use it for for, uh, for homeless camp but, but didn't but, you see the uh I think the the joke at the beginning of the sorry the lockdown just at the end of the sort of the first lockdown a whole bunch of people went to trinity bellwoods and everyone's like a bunch of losers out there at the park a bunch that's of, right that's that. right like everybody rode their may, bikes over. may or june the time frame? everywhere yeah yeah. yeah 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 everybody that was there had a bike i didn't hear anybody go hey cyclists are doing something wrong because nobody ever says cyclists are doing anything wrong but anyway i got an tangent is, is that a is that a <laughs> i don't know where to go with that one but yes <laughs> We'll just leave it at that. I don't. I definitely don't want to get on the wrong side of cyclists. Let's put no, that. Yeah, no, 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 you don't. Yes, yes. Um, so no, so it's certainly yeah. bullets. Yeah. Okay. Dream about it. So basically, it was a. So I needed to. Um, I needed to put something on the resume that had some business acumen. So through the right. concert, uh, ran it for four years or five years, I guess, um, and um, and made a whole bunch of contacts. Um, I thought. Uh, but it still wasn't enough to still wasn't enough to, um, you know, to convince anybody that I was deserving of something other than nightly highlights. So uh, <laughs> it's, I feel I feel like there's sort of like, uh, I, I don't know, I, it, it's 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 like every entrepreneur too. there's this journey where, you know, nobody believes in you until they do. And by then it's like, for some too late. Right. It's almost like. Take. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Anyways, it's, it's almost like, hey, yeah, you know, overnight success. It took me 18 years to get there. Right. Sort of. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a pretty uh, that's a pretty good point, Justin. And I, and I, I couldn't agree more. It was no matter what I did, uh, it was no matter what I did or said, it wasn't going to convince anybody that had said no to say yes. Right. I mean, I'm in sales now and I, I recognize real early in a in a you know, in, in any opportunity whether somebody's going to say yes or not. If they right. say no at the start, cut yeah. bait, move on. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I like to think I, I, I can be persuasive, but only to a point. Right. Right. Yeah. It's tough to sell somebody when they don't really want it. Right. No, it's, if they don't want it, yeah. move on. Right. Move on, yeah. um, but, uh, but yeah, so I couldn't get, it, it wasn't enough to put me over, push me over the hump. So um, and I know this sounds really long winded. You asked how I got from. No, no. I, the whole there. point, the whole point of this show is literally to hear your long winded story. Yeah. So everyone can, can, you know, I used the, I just did the quote in the, in the yesterday show, you know, yeah. I've never really written a quote, but mistakes made lessons learned moving on. Right. So sure. yeah. that's, that's literally, that's how I live life. But anyways, no, bang on man. And, 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 
if you know when I started that that journey to get from broadcasting to the next step, whatever right. it was, and and you know that you know the next there was another stop in there uh, before I got my first sales gig. I always had in mind what my what my goal was, so I never really got. I was never really. I mean, there's some tough moments and and whatever, but I never really got deterred by the process. Right. I was I convinced in my own mind that what I was doing, I was convinced in my own mind what I was doing was right. It was right. the right path, and that long term it was going to pay off. Right. Short term, that might have been a little bit of pain, but I was in a good spot because my wife had a good job, um, so I was able to you know take a couple of risks. Right. Um, so I actually the biggest risk in the, in the process was the 2010 municipal election in Toronto came around and um, I had a couple of contacts uh, both in with, within the, um, the uh, federal liberals and the federal conservatives. I wasn't particularly um, political at the time, okay. but I did care about where I lived and I cared about, you know, um, I cared about Toronto. Um, and um, so I decided to run in the election the cat and, and my, my, I did not know that. I'm going to, I'm going to straight up. I didn't know that. What was it? The municipal or provincial municipal? municipal. So, did you run for mayor? No, it was, no, I was, so was councillor. Well, okay. Yeah, I was okay, a councillor well, okay. in the ward that I lived in downtown. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, my strategy there was, well, I tried to expand my network with the music festival. It didn't get big enough. So here's a way to expand my network even further because you can't even believe how many hands you have to shake and how many introductions you have to make in a three or four month campaign uh, yeah. for, for, for office. I wonder it's, what COVID's like for um, what he calls on the, uh, good point. Like ask Donald a, Trump, I guess. Right. Cause he, it'd be a lot different hands. now, man. Yeah. It'd be so different now. I mean um, I spent days like, all day on the phone asking people for money kind of like raising money right yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you have to do that because your your campaign has uh it costs money i think it costs like 60 grand was the budget for Just the to municipal camp to run yeah. yeah and and i didn't i didn't want to have to bankroll that because here's what happened i had to quit my job at sportsnet to run in the election because that's a conflict of interest you can't be a broadcaster and running an election Political. at the same time. Wow. You have to either take a sabbatical or you have to quit. And Sportsnet said, you're going to have to quit. They kind of called my bluff on it a little bit. Um, so I said, okay, I guess I'm going to have to quit. Uh, so timing because, wise, was this before or after the music festival? Same time, actually. So the All music festival was about four years old. Okay. So I was still doing it. Okay. Um, still political. kind of at Sportsnet and then political. Still very much at Sportsnet. Right. Okay. Um, and then I thought, well, I've come this far. Um, there's no way that I can possibly spend four months shaking hands with people and uh, basically convincing them to give me money that I'm not for my campaign, that I'm not going to be able to make a contact that I can go knock on a door after and say, hey, you want to give me a job? Right. Uh, because I thought that I'd let my I'd let my uh, my sales skills speak, speak for themselves. Right. Um and a funny thing happened, Justin, at the conclusion of the campaign. I lost. I knew there was a chance I was going to win, but I was I was running against Mike Layton. Um, oh, okay. For the last name, Layton. Jack, Jack Layton's what son or? Who's... It was his son. Yeah. Okay. Um, my campaign manager told me it was unwinnable, and he was right. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but but hey, really... we might as well try, right? I mean, I'm I'm gleaning from the story that you got a lot of contacts from that. Right, a that you could par or and your your oh did I freeze? And your your thought process was that you would be able to the risk of doing that and the potential reward of gaining those contacts would outweigh you know whatever they were saying at Sportsnet. Right, it was kind of like this yeah. was going to be an all in you yeah. know win or lose you were going to benefit from it. I was all in and I was going to yeah. benefit one way or the other. I mean, in hindsight, like the worst I, I could have always gone back to broadcasting. I probably would have had to go back crawling on my hands and knees and made less money uh, if I had to go back. But I felt like in terms of what's, what's the risk um, to me again, at the time, there wasn't a lot of risk because I was getting to the point where I could see that um, I could see that my network was growing. 
I could see that I was getting valuable sales experience. I mean, I, I knocked on 23,000 doors, dude, in six months. Like it was ridiculous. Like that's a hard sell. You got 30 seconds to get your point across. Right. (laughs) It's, it's like Jehovah's witness meets, uh, door to door sales. Right. And no one wants to hear from you. Uh, probably two thirds of the people don't even agree with your platform, regardless what you're going to say to them. Yeah. Right, because there's multiple it actually, parties. It's actually ninety percent. Ninety percent. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay, so there you go. So you're you're an uphill battle all the way. Um, yeah. But the experience you gained, right? I mean, a lot of people yeah. talk about like going through sort of the um, you know earning their stripes, right? That's I mean, if you yeah. can cold call or door knock twenty three thousand people, you could pretty yeah. much do anything. It was essentially telemarketing without the telephone. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> it was. With, with a different premise. You're not calling yeah. the, you know, duck cleaning. It's, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. I get that still daily, you know, yeah. duck cleaning. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's it's for a political gain, right? But yeah. interesting. I, I was just thinking, one of the things I was just thinking, so as you were talking about the transition, sports, you know, talking about hockey, talking about the 3HL, one of our things that we sort of pushed was, a lot of like athletes in, in every sport, right. They, they spend their, you know, their, their whole lives literally until they're 30, 35 doing one job. And then they are then forced to go find a new career. And I'm sure a lot of them get the same pushback that you're getting. I mean, some of them get into coaching and, you know, maybe broadcasting or stuff like that, but that's like one in a, you know, in a million kind of thing. The other 999,000 are forced to go potentially start a whole new career, right? So it's kind well, of an you, interesting parallel you know, that you would you would have with them, right? Where you're kind of in yeah. that prime 30s. Yeah, you know what? And and, and my uh my dad was um was pretty um was I uh, was I mean I, my my folks live out west, uh, so I don't talk to them super frequently, but they were they're always very supportive and and um one thing I I you know, I said, because I started thinking about, well, should I go back to school? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be competing for, you know, for opportunities um, with people that, that have, you know, MBAs and, you know, all right. kinds of letters after their names. And, and he said, but the thing is, Sean, is you're 36 years old. And you got a little something called life experience. experience yeah. And, and and for a lot of people, they don't buy into that. And that's fair. That's fair. And if you're, you know, if you're a, high, a decision maker or someone in charge of hiring and you're going to hire based on resume on, or uh, education only, then that's fine. Um, but there's more to a value. People have more to offer than what you learn in school. Like the lessons oh, yeah. you've course. learned, Justin, as an entrepreneur, yeah. like, I don't know what your I don't know what your your education. I have a phys ed is. undergrad and an MBA. Right. So, what have you? Two have you learned ends more of the spectrum. in school? <laughs> like, did you learn more in school, or have you learned more as an entrepreneur? Well, let, let me just tell you, I have a phys ed degree, and we did classes like dance and movement and <laughs> right anatomy. I mean, so I, I I'm not going to knock it. I, I I enjoyed it. It was great. I was going to be a teacher. Um, a gym teacher, but I didn't go that route, went to Korea, taught English, said that's enough for teaching for me. Um, but I would say, yes, you're hundred percent right. The, the experience, I mean, I got into the sales world probably 10 years before you did 15 years before you did like right out of school. I had the same sort of phys ed degree, you know, not going to be a teacher. Yeah. My resume was, you know, on the pile of, okay, he has a degree, but yeah. it's not in business. It's not in accounting. It's not in right. finance. It's not here. Get to door knocking. I believe me. I door knocked for you right. know, pizzas. You know, I think it was like a coupon booklet for pizzas for a couple couple days. I think I did that wow. job. Yeah. yeah. At least yeah, it's, like, it's like here you get thirty dollars worth of coupons for twenty dollars. And it's oh, like wow. yeah, no. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. So, Which is a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. They're making some money there. But yeah, I, I did I did one job actually just to kind of, you know, speak to what you're talking about. One of my first kind of real world jobs, if you will, was um, cold calling Fortune 500 CEOs, selling them $100,000 
packages to the Super Bowl in one call over the phone in mid nine. Wow. Sorry, early early two thousands, mid two thousands. How that? And, and the Masters, it was amazing. Um, I made some of the the best money I'd made in that whole decade doing that. So we'd wow. send people to like Ford Field, ten people, hundred grand. They'd get a huge like sort of buffet type thing. We did Canadian Open as well, sort of smaller packages, the Masters, and then we'd go to some of the events. So I went to Presidents Cups and the one in Montreal. I think in uh, I think I have the thing back here. I don't know what year it was. I've got a, a set from the Presidents Cup here that year. What year is it? As you can see, President's Cup. But yeah, yeah literally, sure. like that was my job. Yeah, they're just balls. It doesn't say the year. Yeah, but it was sure. in Montreal at right the Royal on. Royal Montreal. So that yeah. was my, but it was, the, the job was so grueling. Every day, 200, 300 calls a day. And people wow. would yell at me and scream and say, does your mother know what you do for a Yeah, living? sure. Yeah, I'm like, well, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool if you pay for yeah. it. It's a hundred grand. Yeah, it's expensive, but it's a, it's an experience of a lifetime and you're going to go to the masters and bring your, you know, one of the, one of the packages I sold was 250,000 for the four days of the masters private jet for, I think it was 12 people each day to go from uh, the Island airport to Augusta each day on a private jet. So Not they got, deal. they got like 48 people to, yeah. to wine and dine for you know for 250k for i think it was biovail or i forgot the company i probably shouldn't yeah. say the name of the company because it's um back in the day this before like sarbanes oxley and all this other stuff but um yeah. where they had to like account for their money but yeah that's i mean that's the 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 i guess the dues you have to pay to kind of come yeah. through the world right and Bang those on, lessons right? you can't you can't you can't teach you definitely can't no. teach those lessons so no, you, you cannot you cannot. So, so yeah, that's, um, so yeah, so a lot of the, how did I get to Moneris from there? So, it, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, well, you're the VP of sales now, right? So <laughs> for, for data and insights. Yeah. The, um, so yeah, the, the election, uh, lost the election, um, didn't get a job right out of it. I thought I might, that was a, that was a tense couple months, but just kept uh, kept pounding on the pavement. Ended up at a at a small technology company down at uh, down at uh, Richmond and Spadina, and was there for a couple of years. Then ended up landing at at Moneris, just uh, you know network stuff. So right. Um, and then with the rise of you know data the last couple of years, I've kind of tried to tried to really champion that. I started started a, um, um, doing some POS um, fraud prevention stuff, and then. Okay. But I don't know, I, I really, uh, you know, data, I wouldn't, I'm not as passionate about data as I am about the Oilers, but at the same time, I, there's a huge <laughs> opportunity. We're just, we're just barely scratching the surface and yeah. payment data right now in this era of COVID um, is, and, and, and the impact that COVID has on small businesses. It's so important that governments have consumer spending data to in, to, to base their policy decisions around. You can't just go, you can't just go, like I just heard today the the Toronto, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, not the health minister, the, the um, what the heck is her name? I can't remember. Anyway, the head of, the chief doctor of, okay. of Toronto yeah. says that she wants to close all restaurants and close all arenas, just shut it right. down. Right. And because there's a health risk there. Well, fine. That's fair. That's your lens. But let's hear. Let's see the other lens. The small businesses. What What does a full shutdown mean to those people? So we're talking about lives. They're probably not coming back, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So payment data at Moneris can help the municipalities and the provinces and the feds understand the impact to consumers of the decisions they're making. So, right. you know, so I'm I'm pretty happy to be playing role in that right now because that's this is a part of our business that we haven't really tried to sell before right um we've we've responded to inbound requests but we've never been outbound about it right. so my job now after you know going through sports broadcasting political uh technology now you know into the processing and now into data is to uh is to make sure that our payment data is used to to really support um ultimately small business at right. the end of the day right right interesting and i mean the term i've heard people use and kind of use is collateral damage right it's sort of the 
you know, the, the aftermath of, of the decisions that they're making to, yeah. you know, rightly or wrongly, I don't really want to get into that debate on or that discussion on here. Because again, just yeah. like cyclists, um, we, yeah. we might <laughs> ruffle some feathers on both <laughs> sides of the fence. Right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, hey, at so, the end of the day, here's yeah. what I think everybody can agree on is that yeah. when you make a decision that's going to impact a lot of people, you need understand to understand it. You need to inform. You need to you need to have data to inform yeah. that decision and, and inform policy. Um, and, and I think what we saw back in the spring were decisions that were made based on only medical data. Right. And medical data doesn't make the world go round. Right. And so just out of curiosity, I, I mean, I, I agree with it. Um, you know, having a obviously a better grounding for your decision making, right? So having yep. many multiple sort of data points or, or sure. you know, points of, of interest. Full spectrum. Like full spectrum, exactly, you, exactly. Right? So yeah. just out of curiosity, I mean, like what, what are you talking about? Like when you talk about data points, you know, just number of consumers, dollars spent, types of dollars spent on types right. of, you know, takeout versus like how, how, how minutia does that data get, right? Yeah. It's, or so what do you guys granular. measure? Yeah, granular is the word I meant. Yeah, so it's it's all it's all obviously um, it's all aggregated. So right. we're not it's we're not confidential. Uh, it's even more than confidential. It's it's aggregated to the point where we can't we can't uh, we can't see individual transaction data about you, right. Justin. Right. We don't know that it's you, right. um, and we would never even report on it at that level. Even even if we could, right. what we report on is, for example, in the city of Toronto, we, what we would do is we would group all restaurant accounts together. Right. Right. So we've right. got we've got twenty thousand or two hundred thousand accounts, coast to right. coast or thereabouts. And what we do is we want to group. Um, each of those accounts into different retail categories. So there's there's a category for um, uh, uh, for restaurants. There's a category for um, you know for uh, apparel. There's a category for um, hardware. So you've got all these different categories. Right. So when it came to things like uh, like the restaurants, what is the impact of uh, to um, what's the impact to the restaurant business um, when the city um, opened the sidewalk patios. Right. right? Okay. So, so you can measure decides, differences in decisions sort of we before can and yeah, after. So we right? can measure the lift, right? right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can measure lift on a weekly basis. Right. So the city implements sidewalk patios. Um, we sit, we send the city a report that shows them the lift during that week when they change their policy policy to see if that actually helped the restaurants or vice versa. Um, so Right now, when the, the head of the house says we want to shut down all restaurants, right. okay, well, here's what it looks like, and it falls yeah. off a cliff. And then when right. you see that it never fully comes back, well, the reason it never fully came back was because that's how many went out of business. Right, which that. is which is crazy, right? I mean, I, not that I want specific stats, but do you have sort of numbers? Like, what are some of the declines? Like in you know, let's say March or whenever, sort of like a you know, yeah. it started to maybe where we're at, like, do you have just kind of general numbers, like percentages yeah. even that you could yeah, share with us? So, I'd love to hear. Oh, them. Yeah. 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 So the, um, so the retail category has come back. It's, it's back okay. at year over year. It's, it's at a, you know, a zero, zero percent change year over year. So, so that's like malls and like online kind of thing. Uh, so retail would be um, anything comprised. So there's three, three industry categories. You've got right. travel and entertainment, You've got retail and you've got services. So okay. services are things like, um, you know, insurance and okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Um, like uh, B2B, that sort of stuff. Right. Um, travel and entertainment, bars, restaurants, movie theaters, right. airlines, like right. travel and entertainment. Travel and entertainment yeah. and then you've got retail, which is basically stores. Like you're going yeah. in to buy something from a store. Yeah. Um, so retail has come back. Um, and the interesting thing about, well, so I'll get that a second. So retail has come back. Uh, travel and entertainment um, is still off by about 3%, 4% year over year. Okay. Uh, or sorry, services, 3 to 4%. Travel and entertainment is still off by about 10 to 15%. And the okay. reason is that airlines mainly are, right, are right, right. airlines, trains, that sort of travel. Yeah, yeah. People aren't driving interprovincially as they are. So the one, the one thing that stands out, though, across all of the categories is that, is that, is that, the dollar volumes year over year up 
in, 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 uh, in retail. Uh, the transaction amounts are down, or the trend number of transactions are down. So people, one of two things are happening, maybe both. bigger volume or bigger, bigger ticket sizes, right? That's right. So they're Less not going frequently. out frequently. Right. That's right. So if you're, so if I'm a retailer, I want to know that because I want to maximize the revenue every time Justin comes into my store. I want right. to make sure that I've got lots of point of sale items to make sure that I'm, I'm <laughs> maximizing. Yeah, right? yeah. Upsell, 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 right? Yeah. Right. Or the other thing that could be happening is COVID related inflation or surcharges, right? Oh, so if, right. you know, okay. you're going to get your haircut, you get a $5 surcharge. Uh, you go to buy groceries, like it's so expensive now compared to eight months ago. So maybe a combination of those two things is is creating that gap. Interesting. But, um, but year over year, it's an undeniable gap and it hasn't gone away. So that's, so, I mean, it's, it's also sort of the, I'm thinking like the hoarding mentality, right? It's kind of, you yep. go into Costco, which always is a death trap. You know, it, it's, you go in for one item, you walk out with, you know, six bottles of ketchup and you're like, we're sure. gonna, we, we better get a lot of craft dinner here because we're never going to yeah. eat all this ketchup. But now you're going in and you're probably, you're doubling your, your cart and you're right. kind of walking out of there with twice right. as much as what you might have normally done. Cause you don't want to go back every day to, you know, to pick up milk and eggs. You're going to pick up everything and go once a, every two weeks kind of thing. Right? Yeah. Or you're not going to see your frequent cut. You were so if yeah. you're going into uh, going into a sporting goods store to uh, buy a new hockey stick, um, it might make sense if that if that store offered a twenty percent discount on something else in the store right. that time only, like right. only on that visit. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. But anyway, it's interesting. I think I mean online obviously picked up substantially. Huge, I would assume. Um, yeah. But the funny part is that it's it's kind of reversed again, um, or not reversed, but the the um, it's we're back almost to where we were pre COVID. So, okay, over the summer. Right. So now now going into winter though, you know, are you? I Who guess you, yeah, it'll be interesting. Well, to Quebec's see. on a full shutdown right now, right? Yeah, so. I was just talking to a guy actually earlier today in Montreal. Yeah, that he was because I had to go pick up my kids at school. He's like, "You're going to pick up your kids?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's." it's Business as usual for schools, at least for now, sure. right? So, yeah, cool. Anyways, well, Sean, I, I really appreciate you joining me. Um, yeah, yeah, great, great chat. Uh, good luck with with everything. One one last question. We kind of go in. Um, I guess I'll ask you two last questions. One: When will the Oilers finally make it past the first round? Oh my God! Eh? And. Uh, and <laughs> The, the other one, and I'll, let, I'll let you think of that one. Yeah, exactly. The, the other one is, it's sort of a double question. I used to ask, you know, if you had one word or one piece of advice to give to a younger you, you know, what would it be? But uh, I was talking with a lady the other day and she gave me a, a interesting one. So let's say you're standing there, you're, you're in the eye of a tornado, you're about to, to perish. I'm here. I'm going to tell your family, your loved ones, the world, your last, your last words, what would they be? So those are a couple of different, uh, interesting questions that maybe we'll we'll put ponder ponder a, a moment or two on what was sorry what was the first one when will the oilers win the cup or your final oh word your final word uh or not your final word your final word or a word that you would say to a younger you your final words of wisdom yeah uh maybe maybe final words of wisdom is believe okay. it or not you're not always right <laughs> right. <laughs> I've had trouble with believing that other people are sometimes don't, right. Don't don't tell my wife <laughs> that she's listening though. Yes. Um, yeah. So that would be that one. And will the Oilers win again? Oh, when uh, again? Well, oh, I, I would. I was actually. I mean, I think the answer is yes to again. But yeah. when? 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 How well, soon? they're gonna have to do it in the next. They got McDavid for five more years. He's got to be in the next yeah. five. And or Dry that's, Seidel, that's all he's, she wrote. I mean, you've literally you've got the the next version of Crosby Malkin, right? And right. McDavid Dry Seidel. So you got three or four years here to get it done. I think th I think they'll be better next year. Yeah, there's no question. I think I think they were poised for great things and coming out of that lockout, like it, it was just. Well, as soon as I heard that they were playing Chicago in the first round, yeah, I was like, I know, I that's, like it. Yeah, I don't like how that's this what I, you know what I think they got screwed by Dallas. They were tied. 
and there was like yeah. the 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 win percentage put sure. Dallas as the whatever the four and they were yeah. the the five and they then had they more had, wins. Yeah, they well, that's what I mean. Wins. They actually were. Yeah. It's just the win percentage or whatever. I remember looking at it, but it was like they were literally the fourth place team. They got bumped to five, and that kind of yeah put them up against a, a Blackhawks team that you know has some some talent. You know, in Kane and yeah. Taves and you know some young guys and. Kirby and I don't even know Dak or whatever and all those guys, right? So um, yeah, they just never got going. Just yeah, never got so, it in gear. So so what was the year? What was your prediction? Uh, well, it's got. I mean, it's got to be in the next five years. The contract, the, the McDavid and Drysdale's contract. So we'll say by twenty by twenty twenty four twenty five yeah. somewhere twenty five twenty twenty five by twenty by twenty twenty five they're gonna win. Awesome. Yeah. So you heard it here first, um, Sean. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, yeah, amazing story. And, uh, yeah, let's, I mean, more than welcome to do it again when the three HL is back on, if you ever want to get back into broadcasting, yeah. just part time, come on and do some three HL <laughs> games, come in and come in do and be fun. Do yeah. it for fun. Right. Just come out. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Sean, appreciate it. everyone else powered by backers. I will see you guys again tomorrow. Sean. Awesome. Thank you very much. Cheers, bud. OMG, baby, tell them.